having the opportunity to go around once a year to a different church and to preach. And uh, we're excited about what's happening in our association. We're excited about what's happening in Little Britain as we are trying desperately to become a church that is much more outwardly focused, a church that looks at our community uh, as God looks at our community and desires to reach the lost. And we're very uh, excited about that and trying to do that uh, under the power of the Holy Spirit. And we are thrilled as well that uh, Steve and Blanche Bell are here. Of course, Steve was uh, the senior pastor at Little Britain for a number of years, and any church that has a touch of Little Britain in it is doing very well. Uh, so we're very glad about that, and they're wonderful encouragements uh, to me and to our church also, but we're happy that they're here with you. You know what the toughest job in the entire world is? Parenting. Isn't that the hardest thing in the entire, I don't think there's a day that goes by where my wife and I don't look at each other and say, oh my goodness, we can't do this. We're not, we're not ready for this. We have five kids, uh, and they all have their own personalities, and uh, they all bring their own unique set of wonder and challenges uh, to our lives. And I hope this morning just to be a little bit of, a ch- of an encouragement to you, and I want to start just by reading a couple of stories uh, to encourage you Uh, as parents. This first story is uh, called, When You Thought I Wasn't Looking. When you thought I wasn't looking, I saw you hang my first painting on the refrigerator, and I wanted to paint another one. When you thought I wasn't looking, I saw you feed a stray cat, and I thought it was good to be kind to animals. When you thought I wasn't looking, I saw you make my favorite cake just for me, and I knew that little things are special things. When you thought I wasn't looking, I heard you say a prayer, and I believe there is a God I could always talk to. When you thought I wasn't looking, I felt you kiss me goodnight, and I felt loved. When you thought I wasn't looking, I saw tears come from your eyes, and I learned that sometimes things hurt, but it's all right to cry. When you thought I wasn't looking, I saw that you cared, and I wanted to be everything that I could be. When you thought I wasn't looking, I looked and wanted to say thanks for all the things I saw when you thought I wasn't looking. A second story, uh, also a short one, goes like this. Recently, a woman grabbed my arm at a conference after I had finished speaking on the enormous need we all have for affirmation. Dr. Trent, may I tell you my story, she asked. Actually, it's a story, something my son did with my granddaughter that illustrates what you've been talking about, the importance of affirmation. My son has two daughters, one who's five and one who is in the terrible twos. When a grandmother says this child is in the terrible twos, believe me, she is. For several years, my son has taken the oldest girl out for a date time, but he had never taken the two-year-old until recently. On his first date with the younger one, he took her out to breakfast at a local fast food restaurant. They had just gotten their pancakes, and my son decided it would be a good time to tell this child how much he loved and appreciated her. Jenny, her son, had said, I want you to know how much I love you and how special you are to mom and me. We prayed for you for years, and now that you're here and growing up to be such a wonderful girl, we couldn't be more proud of you. Once he had said all this, he stopped talking and reached over for his fork to begin eating, but he never got the fork to his mouth. His daughter reached out her little hand and laid it on her father's hand. His eyes went to hers, and in a soft, bleeding voice, she said, Longer, Daddy, longer. He put down his fork and proceeded to tell her some more reasons and the ways they loved and appreciated her, and then he reached for his fork again. A second time and a third and a fourth time he heard the words, Longer, Daddy, longer. His father never did get much to eat that morning. But his daughter got the emotional nourishment she needs so much. In fact, a few days later, she spontaneously ran up to her mother and said, I'm really a special daughter, Mommy. Daddy told me so. You know, we live in a world that longs and desires encouragement. Let me just challenge you, parents, moms, and dads. Be your children's greatest cheerleaders. Encourage them. One thing that uh, my my oldest is 12, and one thing that I have seen in in my time at Little Britain is 
is the, the longer you are a parent, the older your kids get, in some ways it gets harder, doesn't it? It's what, it's what I've seen. It's what I've experienced. And let me just encourage you, who, who, those of you who have adult children, encourage them. Affirm them. Tell them you love them and how proud you are of them. Longer, Daddy. Longer. I challenge you to be a church of encouragement. Encourage those who are, who are providing ministry to you in some way or providing ministry uh, to members of your family in some way. Encourage them. Encourage your pastors for the work that they do. Pastors, encourage your congregation members. Build them up. Our world tears us down time and time again. I once heard it said, for every one positive thing you hear in a day, you will hear seven negative. Isn't that incredible? Incredible. We beat each other down so much. Let's be a people of encouragement. Let us encourage one another. My wife spent some time with another uh, woman just uh, a few weeks ago, and, and this woman just longed for affirmation. Wanted to be encouraged. So why don't we encourage one another? And I hope that this morning I can be an encouragement to you. Uh, please turn with me to uh, 2 Kings chapter 6, uh, verses 8 to 23. That will be our passage this morning, 2 Kings chapter 8, uh, 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 8 until 23. Now the king of Aram was at war with Israel. After conferring with his officers, he said, I will set up my camp in such and such a place. The man of God sent word to the king of Israel, beware of passing that place because the Arameans are going down there. So the king of Israel checked on the place indicated by the man of God. Time and time again, Elisha warned the king so that he was on his guard in such places. This enraged the king of Aram. He summoned his officers and demanded of them, will you not tell me which of us is on the side of the king of Israel? None of us, my lord the king, said one of his officers. But Elisha the prophet who is in Israel tells the king of Israel the very words you speak in your bedroom. Go find out where he is, the king ordered, so I can send men and capture him. The report came back, he is in Dothan. Then he sent horses and chariots and a strong force there. They went by night and surrounded the city. When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, O oh Lord, open his eyes so he may see then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. As the enemy came down toward him, Elisha prayed to the Lord, strike these people with blindness. So he struck them with blindness as Elisha had asked. Elisha told them, this is not the road and this is not the city. Follow me and I will lead you to the man you are looking for. And he led them to Samaria. After they entered the city, Elisha said, Lord, open their eyes, the eyes of these men, so they can see. Then the Lord opened their eyes, and they looked, and there they were inside Samaria. When the king of Israel saw them, he asked Elisha, Shall I kill them, my father? Shall I kill them? Do not kill them, he answered. Would you kill men you have captured with your own sword or bow? Set food and water before them so they may eat and drink and then go back to their master. So he prepared a great feast for them. And after they had finished eating and drinking, he sent them away and they returned to their master. So the bands from Aram stopped raiding Israel's territory. May God bless the reading of his word. Before I went to Bible college to go into ministry, my dream, my desire was to do play-by-play -play for Hockey Night in Canada. That's what I wanted to do right out of high school in fact, I knew from grade 8 on, that is all I wanted to do. Everything I took in high school was uh, toward that goal. I went to Niagara College uh, to pursue a diploma in broadcasting. And in your first year, uh, you take uh, three media specialties altogether. You take radio, television, and film. 
And in our first year of filming, uh, if you're the lighting guy, which was one of the roles that I had, uh, and you're filming outside, it's a very complicated task because the lighting changes, especially if it's kind of a sunny and a cloudy day. And any of you who are familiar with photography know that it can be a bit tricky sometimes because if the clouds pass in the sun, it's a different lighting. And and sometimes if it's bright and sunny, it's a different lighting and so on and so forth. So we had to take a light reading every time that we were to take a shot. And so we had this little device that uh, read the light for us. And then we would tell the camera guy that uh, this is the aperture you need so you get the right lighting for the shot that is to be taken. And then if you have to retake the shot because it didn't go well, you'd have to retake the lighting reading and do it again so it always looked right. The best weather for shooting is a day like this because the light hardly ever changes outside. If you're going to shoot outside, you like the cloud because the light doesn't change a lot. As we went through this exercise, it dawned on me how amazing the human eye is It's a remarkable, remarkable little thing. In fact, did you know that they recently found a new body part to the human body? And it's found in the eye. They found another layer to your cornea. And doctors are thrilled about this because when they do eye surgery, uh, there's a great danger of infection. But they think now understanding this new layer of the cornea, which nobody ever knew about before, it will help them in these surgeries. The eye is a remarkable, remarkable creation of God. It's controlled by six muscles. In the retina, there are these special cells called rods and cones, and they process light. The rods help us to see black and white and shades of gray. The cones help us determine colors. According to a Wikipedia article, the human eye is able to discern 10 million different colors. How many rods and cones do you have that help you determine these 10 million different colors and shades and so on? Each eye has 120 million rods and 7 million cones packed into each eyeball. It's remarkable. From the moment you open your eyes in the morning to when you close them at the end of the day, your eyes take in a vast amount of information of the world around you. Shapes, colors, movements, and more. And it's done... Instantly, it's remarkable how fast your eyes focus. You can be looking way down the street and be in focus. You can look at the floor in front of you and be in focus. And even if you need glasses, your eyes can see through the lenses and determine and focus. It's remarkable what the human eye can do. Some of us do need a little help with glasses or contact lenses, but they still process all the information for your brain. This is something that's incredible for nothing uh, any larger than a ping pong ball. That is no, how big your eye is. In 2 Kings 6, 8-23, eye, sight, and vision play a prominent role. And we are challenged to expand our vision and not just see the material world around us, but to see through the eyes of faith. To know there's a lot more happening in the world other than just what the physical eye can tell. There is a God who is working and accomplishing, protecting and acting on behalf of His people. And I want you to have a prayer that comes out of this sermon. And it goes like this. It's a very simple prayer. It's a very short prayer. Lord, help me see through the eyes of faith. Lord, help me see through the eyes of faith. Fathers, see through the eyes of faith. Help your wife. Husbands, help your wives. Fathers, help your children. See through the eyes of of faith. The first point that we see here is that seeing through the eyes of faith gives confidence in God's message. Seeing through the eyes of faith gives confidence in God's message. In this passage, you will note there are only two individuals who are named. There is the man of God, Elisha, and God Himself. They are the only two who are named. Initially, Elisha is simply known as the man of God. That's how he's introduced to us. There is no other explanation needed. What kind of character, what kind of relationship with God must he have when somebody can say, hey, the man of God is in town and everyone knows exactly who you're talking about. There's the man of God. They don't even need to name him. Everybody knows who he is. His relationship with God was such that when you spoke of him, you spoke of the man of God. Elisha was the successor to Elijah's ministry. He was well respected by the people, by the school of prophets, and by the king of Israel, who we will note later in this passage refers to him as father, giving him great respect. 
At this time, as we've read, Aram, or Syria, is at war with Israel. And the king of Aram kept making plans to attack Israel, but each time Elisha, through his uh, connections with God, would inform the king of Israel of Aramean plans. Each time Aram is thwarted in their attempts to attack Israel. And verse 10 indicates this happened several times. Whenever God would communicate to Elisha about the uh, placement of the Aramean troops, Elisha never doubted God's message. Not once did he ever doubt God's message. He would go to the king of Israel completely confident in God's word. Here's a question for you and I. Do we ever doubt God's message? Do we ever read things in the Bible or hear things taught or preached and we know it's the Word of God, but we're we're unsure, we're hesitant, we doubt? Elisha never doubted God's message. And each time that Israel was successful in avoiding these attacks, each time the king of Aram would get angrier and angrier, he is enraged, according to the NIV. But the word here in the Hebrew gives this picture of a sea that is uh, tossing and churning and the waves are great and it's kind of this violent sea storm. The same word is used in Jonah chapter 1 and verse 11 where the sea is getting rougher and rougher because Jonah the prophet is leaving God behind and going on his own little trip because he doesn't want to do what God tells him to do. And this is the sense of the king of Aram. He's churning inside perplexed about Israel, always knowing about what he's going to do, encountering it. And he concludes, notice in verse 11, that he must have a spy among us. And he says this to his uh, officers. Will you not tell me which of us is on the side of the king of Israel? One of you is uh, letting go of state secrets. That's the only way in the world that uh, Israel could know. And one of the officers speaks up. He says, no, Lord. It's Elisha, the prophet is in Israel, and and he tells the king of Israel the very words you speak in your bedroom. Your greatest secrets, the most confidential conversations that you are having, Elisha knows. Elisha's reputation has gone beyond the borders of Israel. It could be because in the previous chapter he he healed Naaman. And so Naaman went back to Syria. He was a general there. And maybe he told others about Elisha. But Elisha has a reputation beyond the borders of Israel. There are no secrets from God is something else that we learn here. Nothing is hidden from his sight. He is aware of all the things we say and do. In this case, he knew the king of Aram's war plans. And he relayed them to Elisha to protect his people Seeing through the eyes of faith gave Elisha confidence in God's message. He never second-guessed. He never doubted God's word. Fathers, if there is any legacy that we can pass on to our children, it is absolute confidence in the word of God. Let's do that. Let us with confidence know the word of God, apply it to our lives, and pass it on to our children. Seeing through the eyes of faith, this is our second point, gives assurance in troubling situations. Seeing through the eyes of faith gives assurance in troubling situations. Given this information by his officer, the king of Aram devises a plan to capture Elisha. He's going to send a force to surround the city of Dothan, where Elisha resides, to capture him. And he's sending a large force that includes foot soldiers and cavalry, and chariots, and they surround the city. Now we have to take a moment here and pause and note the irony of what's happening in this passage. If Elisha is being told by God about all the movements of the Aramean soldiers so that the troops of Israel will not have to encounter them, don't you think it's possible that God is also going to tell Elisha that the king of Aram is plotting for his life and is going to surround his city? That's rather ironic. There's many different spots in Scripture that have this kind of irony. How could the king think that he could keep this a secret from Elisha? Maybe by sending such a large force at night, which he did, he thinks he can outfox him and capture this one man. 
And the next character is introduced, and this is Elisha's servant. And he gets up the next morning, he looks out, and he sees, he sees with his eyes, the city is surrounded by enemy soldiers. The millions of rods and cones in his retina distinguish the colors of the Aramean army, and they tell him that he is in danger. And he returns to Elisha, and he says, what shall we do? Because his physical sight is telling him, all hope is lost, we're going to be captured, at the very least we're going to become slaves, or most likely we're going to be killed. Because that's what his eyes tell him. That is what his physical sight tells him. His, conclu- his conclusion is that all is lost. What now? Sometimes when commentators said the appropriate prayer is not, O oh God, rescue me, but O oh God, open my eyes that I may see your providential presence. O God, rescue, not O God, rescue me, but open my eyes that I may see your providential presence. Next two verses are key to this passage and the ones I want us to remember. Elisha begins to answer the phrase that is oft repeated in Scripture that we all need to memorize, don't be afraid. In the King James, it's fear not. Did you know that the single most repeated command in all of Scripture to the believer is don't be afraid. It happens all over the place in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And if don't be afraid is too hard to memorize, get your King James out and memorize fear not. Two words instead of three. Fear not. Elisha is completely unfazed. He's not worried that this army has come against him. His enemies cause him no trouble in any way, no terror. Why is he so confident? Because he sees through the eyes of faith. He has an understanding of God's ways. He knows there is more to this situation than meets the eyes. Notice verses 16 and 17. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, O Lord, open his eyes so he may see Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. One writer says this, verse 16 is one of the most memorable, unforgettable words of Scripture. It emphasizes the importance of seeing things from God's point of view with spiritual insight, with faith. Elisha knew what was happening. He knew who was out there, and he prayed that his servant may see the same thing. He prayed that his servant would know that God was in control. He prayed that his servant could have courage. He prayed that his servant would see through the eyes of faith and have assurance even in a difficult situation where his life is threatened. Now the writer says this, Elisha's servant personifies the despair and fear that come when we depend on human judgment and common sense. But Elisha personifies the confidence that comes from faith when we depend on God's power. Notice that Elisha did not pray that God would send help. It was already there. He simply prayed for open eyes to see it. The help was there. God was already present in the midst of a difficult situation. Elisha knew it. But his servant needed to know it too. And his eyes are opened And he sees the hills full of horses and chariots of fire. They were a heavenly army more powerful and more vibrant than the Aramean army. There is a spiritual dimension we need to take into account at all times. Our physical senses are not enough to help us determine the extent of any situation. There are other things that are happening and God is always, always Always working. A couple of verses from the Psalms convey the kind of confidence Elisha had in God. Psalm 3 6 says this I will not fear the tens of thousands drawn up against me on every side. I will not fear the tens of thousands drawn up against me on every side. Psalm 27 3 says this. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then will I be confident. I will not fear. My heart will not fear. Even then will I be confident. Why did the psalmist have such courage? 
because they know that God is with them. Seeing through the eyes of faith gives us assurance in troubling situations. Fathers, as Elisha passed on to his servant the importance of seeing through the eyes of faith so that he could have assurance in troubling situations, let us do the same. Let us pass on that assurance that we can have because we see through the eyes of faith. Our final point here, seeing through the eyes of faith, we witness extraordinary results. Seeing through the eyes of faith, we witness extraordinary results. The Aramean army is now moving uh, towards the city to capture Elisha. The man of God prays again. Notice prayer is a key part of this passage. It occurs again and again and again. And this time he prays that the men may be struck with blindness. Now this word for blindness is the same one used in Genesis 19 when the angels that came to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah struck the men coming against the door. They struck them with blindness. And it's not a physical blindness, but a confusion of the mind. A supernatural impediment to what their eyes are telling their brains. And this is made clear by the fact because we see that the Aramean army is actually able to follow Elisha to Samaria from Dothan. They're able to ride their horses and drive their chariots and walk in a straight line. So clearly, physically, they're able to see something is clouding their minds. They're not able to understand that, yes, this is Elijah, and yes, this is the man that they are after. They are blinded to those facts. And so these men follow him all the way to Samaria. Once they get to Samaria, the army at once that once surrounded Elisha is now surrounded in the enemy's capital. Elisha prays again in verse 20. The word there is said. And the confusion is gone and they realize where they are. And now they are the ones trapped. And the king of Israel is delighted. He cannot contain his glee that this army has been delivered to him. Notice what he says in verse 21. Shall I kill them, my father? Shall I kill them? He wants to wipe them out. He's excited because these enemy troops are here and he could give a damaging blow to the Aramean armies and maybe they would leave them alone. He's been given this gift. Didn't have to go into battle. He didn't lose a soldier. He wants to wipe them out. But notice, he waits for the prophet of God, for the man of God to speak. And notice how he addresses him there. He says, Father. Here's the king of a nation whose word should be law, but he stops and he waits and he listens to what the man of God has to say. He will not go against Elisha. Elisha is looking here for a greater victory than the destruction of this force that comes against him. Instead of destroying them, what does he tell the king to do? He says, feed them. Give them a feast. Treat them well. Look after them. You know what that is? grace. It's mercy. Here's an enemy delivered into your hands. They're right in your city. You know what? Treat them well. Look after them. And then send them away. What do you think the response of these soldiers who were captured and could have been executed was going to be when they got back to their homeland? What do you think it is that they would have said How would they have expressed their gratitude for still being alive? For the power of God they witnessed in their dealings with Elisha. For the great feast they were given. Whatever they said, and none of it is recorded for us. Whatever is said, we don't know. But we do know this. We know that Aram stopped invading Israel. The attack stopped. When they went back, they said something. And in their report to the king... The attacks stop. The story starts with Israel at war and ends with Israel in peace. Seeing through the eyes of faith brings extraordinary results. The lesson for the nation of Aram was to show them that it was what it was like to deal with the prophet of the true God, against whom no human power could be of any avail, that they might learn to fear the Almighty God. He who is in me is greater than he who is in the world, right? No matter what, we serve a God who is more powerful than anything this world can throw against us, than anything any enemy like Satan can throw against us. The lesson for Israel is this, that Yahweh, their covenantal God, was her strong deliverer. 
as well as her true king. Fathers, husbands, let us help our family see through the eyes of faith that they too may witness extraordinary results. Here in this passage, two nations are touched by the power of God through one man's faithfulness because he saw through the eyes of of faith. Seeing through the eyes of faith gave him confidence in God's message, assurance in troubling situations, and brought extraordinary results. Results that could not have been achieved in any other way but through God. What situations are you facing where you are responding like Elisha's servant? You're looking at your life and you're saying, this is too hard. I'm struggling too much. I cannot see any way out of this. My family life is terrible. My work life is terrible. My paycheck doesn't cover my bills. What situations are you facing where you're afraid? Maybe your health isn't what it should be and you have a fear inside of you because of that. What situations do we need to ask God to help us see through the eyes of faith? How can we as fathers and husbands lead our families to do so? Let me encourage you as we draw to a close. One good way to begin is simply this. Confess your fear. Lord, I'm afraid of in this situation. Lord, I... I don't know how I'm going to get out of this. I don't know what situation, what's going to have to change. I can't do it on my own. But you have said time and time again your word, fear not. Lord, help me not to be afraid. Lord, open my eyes that I may see through faith, being confident in your word, having assurance in troubling situations, and then watching you bring extraordinary results. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we have been reminded of your incredible power this morning. We have seen that in terrible situations where where lives are being threatened, you can bring about extraordinary results. And Elisha had complete and total confidence in you. He knew. He knew what it was like to live life seeing through the eyes of faith. And may we do the same. Lord, we confess we are afraid of so many things. There are things in our past that we struggle with and we don't want to come back to haunt us. There are things in our present that we are going through that that we just have such a hard time with. There are things about the future and we don't know what it's going to hold. And so that brings fear. Lord, help us set that aside. Open our eyes that we may see. Lord, we have sung many songs this morning with that wonderful Hebrew word, Hosanna. Lord, save us. Pray, Lord, that we will cry out to you for rescue. That we will see your extraordinary work. And we can point back in our lives to many times where we can say, the Lord did that. The Lord did that. The Lord did that. So Lord, increase our faith. Help us to see through eyes that include you in all things, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. Oh,
desire to encourage you through this program. If you do not yet belong to a church, we'd love to have you come and connect with us. We have programs for all ages. There is a spiritual need, or if you have been blessed through our service, we'd love to hear from you. You can contact us during regular office hours by phone, or you can email us. Thank you for watching our service. May God bless you.